Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show from Stormont, the home of the Northern Irish Assembly. 100 years ago, the early leaders of this province declared it a Protestant parliament for a Protestant state. After 20 years of peace, things are very different now. But with further political change on the way post-Brexit, what is the future of unionism in Northern Ireland? We talk today to two leading politicians with very different views as to how the unionist community should address the future. Now, Mike Nesbitt, uh, Assemblyman, uh, former leader of the Ulster Unionist Party. The Assembly's back in business. Uh, what's going on at Stormont again? Uh, changes afoot, the election in the Republic, uh, uh, the Brexit settlement, putting a border in the, in the Irish Sea. Uh, what's your reading of how that's going to impact on the medium term in Northern Ireland? The only certainty, I think, is that the old certainties have gone. Things have changed tremendously, Alex. I mean, if, if you, you contrast the visit of Pope John Paul II in 79, when over a million came to an outdoor mass, and the more recent visit of Pope Francis, uh, where, to my mind, when, when Taoiseach Varadkar greeted him, he effectively said, Your Holiness, you're really, really welcome, but don't be touching anything, because it's not yours anymore. You know, and, and with a hundred years remove, I think we look back and say that the old unionist battle cry of home rule was Rome rule had a certain validity, but that validity has gone. And in the same way that, that Northern Ireland was created to have a Protestant majority, that has gone too. We are a minority. We are a country of minorities. And it's not even a question in some unionist quarters of how are we going to react to that. It's a step back from that. Do you even realise that this is now the case? And then, once we absorb that fact, how are we going to react to it? And, and to my mind, we react to it by looking at it as an opportunity and truly embracing the diversity uh, that we tried to celebrate in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement from 1998. So, perhaps some of these initiatives uh, where you seem to be trying to build a centre ground of, of politics between the SDLP and Ulster Unionist Party to be a rival to the Sinn Féin DUP duopoly, would they be more amenable now in the present circumstances than perhaps they were a few years ago? I think perhaps, uh, and I judge that on the evidence of, of the surge for the Alliance Party, that middle ground party, uh, last year in the European and the local government elections where they did incredibly well. Uh, what I was trying to say back in, back in 2017 was that you've had 10 years now of the DUP and Sinn Féin running our coalition government uh, out of Stormont Castle. And you don't need any more evidence that they can't get on, that they can't cooperate, that they cannot deliver for you. So let's have an alternative. And the alternative has to be not one party, but one unionist party and one nationalist party. So that was ourselves and the SDLP. And when I looked at uh, Colm Eastwood when he took over the SDLP, I heard him saying what I was saying, which was we need to make Northern Ireland work. And when I sat down and spoke to him, it was the same measurements, the quality of the health service, the education system, the infrastructure, and prosperity. So I, I find a lot of common ground politically with Colm, and given the fact that we have this mandatory coalition, that we're into power sharing is the only way to go forward, that was the proposition I put to the people. Maybe it was two years too early. Would you see one of the messages of the Christmas election in terms of Northern Ireland, uh, and for that matter the February uh, election in the Republic, uh, is that the, the people wanted more attention to uh, mind your knitting, as we'd say in Scotland, the bread and butter issues, the health service in Northern Ireland, the housing crisis in the Republic. What do you take from that if that was the message that the voters North and South were delivering? I would take from that that they were getting mature. Uh, about our, our politics that we realise that the constitutional question is not the be-all and end-all. I believe that what we should be doing is trying to make Northern Ireland work, irrespective of whether that is to make us more attractive to the rest of the United Kingdom to stay in the UK, or whether your ultimate destination is to get some sort of united Ireland. If, if we fix the health service, the education system, bring in the infrastructure which, which will make our economy stronger, that is more than a lifetime's political activity as far as I'm concerned. So it's not for me. It may not even be for my children. It might be for my grandchildren to make the call on the constitutional question. But let's work on all that in the meantime. And what I've never understood about Sinn Féin, who lead the charge for United Ireland, is that they've always described Northern Ireland as a failed statelet. 
Well, if we're going to have a united Ireland, the people of the Republic have to vote for change. What is attractive about saying to those people, will you vote to adopt 1.8 million really high maintenance people, half of whom don't want to be members of a united Ireland, uh, some of whom might even get quite violent about it, and who live in a failed statehood? What's going to attract you to vote? I want them as part of my country. It's taken the Republic 100 years to get comfortable in its own skin. So why disrupt all that? Why turn all those tables over by adopting Northern Ireland under those circumstances? From the vantage point of Northern Ireland, the Republic as a non-theocratic state now, a successful state now, looks rather more attractive, doesn't it? See, when I was growing up, you knew you'd cross the border because the roads got worse and you were living in a state controlled by a church. And these days the roads get better and you're going into a country that is much more progressive, you could argue, than, than Northern Ireland. But I would add four ironies and a paradox. Irony number one, the biggest obstacle to United Ireland as I grew up was the IRA because their bombs and their bullets represented a coercion unionism would never give in to. Irony two, the organisation probably doing most to promote a united Ireland today are the Democratic Unionist Party. Their policies, not least supporting Brexit, but also their tone and their attitude are really bad for the long-term future of the UK. Irony three, the biggest break on Irish unity is probably the Irish political establishment. Fianna Foyle and Fine Gael both know that nobody's ready. And the fourth irony is that after decades of unionists looking over their shoulders thinking that Irish nationalists were the enemy. It's not even Scottish nationalists anymore. English nationalism is the biggest threat to the future of the United Kingdom. And the paradox is unionists who, who analyse the Brexit referendum know full well that the lesson for a border poll in Irish unity is don't go to the polls until you've thought through the implications of change to the nth degree. And yet those same people will say to you, don't debate it in public, don't talk about it, because the more you talk about it, the more likely it is to happen. That's fascinating stuff. So where are we with, with these four ideas and the big paradox? There's now going to be a border of some sort, mm -hmm. a customs border in the Irish Sea. Where does that leave unionism in the medium term? That leaves us feeling, as, as we often do, friendless, uh, betrayed, and totally uncertain about our future. You know, nationalism is always about a process. We're on the road to something. Unionism is always looking for a full and final settlement, whether it was partition in the 1920s or the Belfast Good Friday Agreement in 1998. We're always in search of something that says, here is stability and here is certainty going forward. And Brexit was never going to deliver that. It was always going to be exactly the opposite. So I've never understood why any unionist who thought it through would support a Brexit referendum. Now you caused quite a stir a few weeks ago uh, when you uh, co-sponsored an anti-sectarianism report. Uh, and you give this analogy about unionists being uh, 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 like a frog. Tell, mm. us, tell us what you meant by that. Well, it, it's a story I read a while ago about a particular type of frog and the characteristic of the frog is if you put it in a pan of cold water and really, really slowly bring that water up to boiling point, the frog dies because it doesn't realise that the environment around it is changing in a way that represents an existential threat. And my concern is that unionism could be that frog. The old certainties have gone, the environment is changing, uh, the demographics are changing in Northern Ireland, we're now a minority, uh, and the demographics who traditionally support the SDLP and Sinn Féin are on their way to becoming a majority. You've got Scotland looking for independence, you've got this rise of English nationalism, all these things are going against us, and you've got the DUP who in my analysis are doing nothing to try and promote the union. I, I think they're tactical, but they're not strategic. Think about the confidence and supply when, when that chance result in the general election left them holding the balance of power. They asked for a billion or a billion and a half pounds. Short term, brilliant. That's money into our economy, into our public services. But long term, what's the damage with English nationalists? Because they look at that and they say, 26 years after your ceasefires, why are you a special case anymore? Why do you need money for your hospitals when we need money? And that billion and a half,
you know, that's acute hospitals, that's Bobby's on the beat in England, that's classroom assistance, that's Boris Johnson language. So isn't the logic of, of your analogy with the frog, that unionism, if they're thinking about it, given the medium term outlook, should be cutting a deal now? Isn't, isn't the unionism in not now never going to be in a stronger position to set or at least debate terms with the Republic than at this moment, as opposed to, to waiting a, another 20 years when unionism is going to be a much smaller natural electorate? If, if political change is coming, we've gone way beyond the binary of the status quo of staying in the UK as is, or that traditional sense of creating a 32 county unitary Irish state. There are all sorts of other possibilities. There's direct rule, there's joint authority, there is uh, you know, one country, two systems. Not popular given that's the Hong Kong model these days. You, right through to repartition, there's probably six or seven options. I'm not advocating for anything but making Northern Ireland work. But people need to realise that there's not a binary anymore. In the, in the same way that the population in this country isn't a binary, we're not all either Protestants or Catholics, Unionists or Nationalists. There's a big group called Other, a very unpoetic term for them. But it is the others who will decide our future constitutionally. And what would you say to members of the Unionist community eh, worried about the emergence of a, a single economic entity in the island of Ireland? Or to members of the, the Nationalist community who might be concerned about the the disappearance of the European community or union overview of the Belfast Agreement. Can both communities simultaneously be fearful of the future? The 1998 agreement said that we self-define our identity. We can be British, we can be Irish, we can be both, we can be whatever. And there's no hierarchy anymore. Being British isn't more important or better than being Irish. What a lot of nationalists, but some unionists as well think, happened in that referendum was that English nationalists came in over their head and did exactly what the agreement said could never happen and denied them their sense of Europeanness. So there's an Ulster poet from, from the last century, John Hewitt, who refused to define himself in a binary term. He said, I'm an Ulsterman, but I'm also Irish and British and European. And he went on to say why it was important. He said, if you deny any part of that, you diminish who I am. And that's what a lot of people felt after the Brexit referendum. People from Northern Ireland who wanted to remain part of the EU and feel European. They felt it had been denied them in the way the agreement said could never happen, and they felt diminished. So we're talking about people who, if you went to them and your first question was, would you like to see a United Ireland someday? They would say yes, but that's an aspiration. If your second question was, will you join us to be an activist? They would have said no. I'm too busy, too busy earning good money, having my children well educated, just enjoying life to be bothered which flag flies from Stormont. But after the 24th of June 2016, the answer to the second question is, where do I sign up? Mike Nesbitt, on the, the, the subject of parity of Stephen, I brought along a quake. Uh, uh, now, there's only one stipulation here, there's whiskey obviously in the quake, it has to be scotch. None of this Irish stuff, north or south. Oh, it doesn't work with anything else. Oh, that's that's a big challenge. That's <laughs> but it's for you, sir. Ach, thank you and very And round all indeed. your friends, nationalists and unionists. Thank you very much indeed. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yes, Black Bush will look very well in there. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Nesbitt represents Strangford in the Northern Irish Assembly. But the Westminster parliamentarian for the same constituency is Jim Shannon. Join us after the break to find out a very different view of the future of unionism. Welcome back. I continue my conversation on the future of unionism in Northern Ireland with Jim Shannon, the Member of Parliament for Strangford. Jim Shannon, welcome back to the Alex Salmon Show. Oh, I'm very pleased to be here in Belfast as well. Wow. You come to us, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Makes the weeks a change. Usually we interview yeah. in, the, in the green outside yeah, absolutely, the, uh, the yeah. House of Commons. But nice. now, of course, it is appropriate because the Assembly mm -hmm. is back and running in Stormont. Yeah. How important uh, a development do you rate that as? Uh, I, I think it's crucial. I think it's critical. Um, I think the election uh, before Christmas told us just how critical it was. Um, we all got a, um, a lesson at the election um, and, and released to our majorities and 
in, in, in my case, and, and unfortunately lost two other colleagues, and I think as an indication. Uh, I knew a week into the election that we were, we were, this election was different, and I said that to my election agent, Michelle McElveen, and to my workers and, and, and canvassers. I says, guys, uh, this, this election's a different election. Uh, the people are, are annoyed about the assembly not working, they're annoyed about the health service, uh, they're annoyed about education, they're annoyed about roads. So uh, you as a Westminster Member of Parliament, mm -hmm. You found yourself campaigning just before Christmas in the Westminster mm -hmm. election, and people were saying to you, we're not going to vote for you, Jim, because that assembly should be up and running. I, I think some people decided they weren't going to vote for us, uh, but there was others who told us they weren't happy either. And I know they were giving us our vote this time round, uh, and, and, and we thanked them for that. At the end of the day, they were saying, look, get the assembly working get the health minister back, get the health department back, don't let this go any longer. I think people were saying either the assembly goes back or direct rule comes in. One thing had, was, was clear, it had to come to an end, the, the impasse that we had in Northern Ireland, uh, and we reflected that. And you moved very quickly, yeah, well, within yeah. a month or so, mm -hmm. helped by the Northern Irish Secretary, who the seemed to have played a good enabling role mm -hmm. in doing that, and then got the sack for his pains. Yeah. Um, uh, Personally, um, my I've, I've had some fairly strong comments with uh, Julian Smith. He knows that. Uh, I also recognise uh, uh, um, hard work when it, when the efforts put in. Uh, he, he certainly had the, the measure. I use that uh, uh, very very carefully. The measure of the political parties, the measure of the of the Irish Republic as well, and and their ministers in the Taoiseach. I, I think he um, it would have been better, in my opinion, if he had a stayed. Uh, to oversee uh, the political process in the next two years. There won't be an assembly election for two years. So between now and then, uh, I think it's important that we had someone who uh, the parties had maybe not always agreed with, but probably they respected. Uh, and, and, and personally, I think it would be better if he stayed, but he's moved on. Um, the reasons for that are better known to the Prime Minister and probably to him. Uh, with a new Maybe Dominic Cummings knows the answer. Uh, well, he's pulling the strings, uh, and that's for sure. Uh, I think the new Secretary of State is still uh, a capable guy, uh, very loyal to Boris Johnson. Uh, we'll see how that goes, but he needs to have that working relationship with the parties. I, I think Julian Smith had that. Uh, I hope that the present Secretary of State has the same working relationship and the same understanding. We've got an agreement, by the way, let's be honest, Alex. We've got an agreement It's not entirely perfect. It's not a perfect for us, so we're, we're not happy with everything. But it's just better to get back to work. That's, honestly, it's better to have, a, have an accountable minister for education, accountable minister for health. I mean, I, I said, mentioned to you earlier on, there's, there's somewhere in the region between 80 and 90,000 people waiting for appointments, for assessments, for operation, out of a population of 1.8 million. 80 to 90,000 people waiting for appointments and assessments and, and so on. It's just, it just doesn't work. Uh, I mean, the fact of the matter is that the, the health service could not have went on much longer the way it was. It's good to have a minister in place that's accountable. Now, you're an experienced hand uh, politically, and I've observed many uh, members of parliament from mm -hmm. Northern Ireland at Westminster over the years. And you probably more than any other single person have been noted for pursuing Let's call them the bread and butter yeah, issues yeah. of politics, so uh, the <laughs> health and education, yeah. which has been unusual in Northern Ireland mm. politicians often because th that when the assembly was up and running, the assembly were dealing with that, mm. and the constitutional issue, obviously, and during the troubles, the violence, the murder loomed large mm. in questioning. Yeah. But you and I'm just interested that your experience is that the demand from the public in Northern Ireland to get the assembly back up and running was a demand to address issues like the health service. Uh, I, I think anyone who was in the campaign trail before Christmas and at Westminster elections uh, got that from everyone, and I, I got it. I got it regularly. Uh, I respond to what the people tell me. I, I, I try to keep in touch with the grassroots. Um, I was always one, Alex, for bread and butter issues. It was me at the very beginning when I first came into council in 1985. Bread and butter issues were always me. Uh, I loved it. I, I loved the interaction with people. And, and uh, I got that, the opportunity at the Forum for Political Dialogue, I got the opportunity at the Assembly, and now I've got the opportunity at Westminster. So uh, party spokesperson for health, party spokesperson on human rights, uh, party spokesperson on equality issues, and also on DWP, Department of Works and Pensions. So they, they, they keep you really in, in touch with your people. And you must have looked, when you, the Irish election, the mm. Republic election yeah. in February, you must have looked at that and thought, wow. it's quite interesting that it seems to be these sort of issues which yeah. are unexpectedly dominating that campaign, with housing in particular emerging as a, a 
enormous issue which did yeah. many ways set the pace of the campaign. Yeah, I, I, I certainly took note of that and and, and, I, and it doesn't do with the political parties but one political party and, and that just happens to be Sinn Féin resonated with the, the populace in the Republic of Ireland, observationally looking at it from the outside in uh, and it seemed to me that uh, you know you can talk about Brexit as much as you want and it's a big issue. Uh, I have to say that in my election back in December um, most people were not talking about Brexit, they were talking to me about those bread and butter issues. They were talking about the State of the Union uh, and, and those are the critical issues. So whenever I looked at the, at the, the uh, election in the Republic of Ireland, uh, I could understand exactly what was happening. The big parties said they were going to address housing, they said they were going to address homelessness, they said they were going to address the health issues. Well, people believed that they hadn't uh, and they looked for someone new that could do that and, and uh, Sinn Féin got a substantial vote. But the Democratic Unionist Party ha moved from a position because of the Christmas election from one of enormous influence at Westminster, effectively holding the, the fate of the government in the palm of your hand yeah. to one where there's a Tory majority of 80 mm -hmm. and Boris Johnson's putting the customs border in the Irish Sea and he's not, I suspect, going to be convinced by DUP MPs to change his mind. I think we're, we're living in a new world uh, um, and, and uh, there's a new king there and, and, and he's got a massive majority. Uh, we don't have the influence we, we had prior to the election. Um, he's got an 80 seat majority, can basically do what he wants. I said to Stephen Fire, the new MP from North Down, when he moved in, I, I'm sitting in the back seat behind him in the first vote. The first day we had votes, we had three votes and the government had a majority of 89, 92 and 96. I said, Stephen, see that tonight? That's the way it's going to be from now on for the next five years. I said, you may get used to it. We're not going to have any influence in here upon them. They will pursue their party policies, their, their, what they want to see change. And so uh, I, I think we, we, we have to um, observe uh, that, that we don't have the influence anymore, and we accept that. And we're two people down as well. We're two MPs down from our 10 down to 8, and we have to also accept the political realities of that. Uh, does it mean that uh, uh, we can have influence? I think maybe we are. Uh, 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 I, I'll be truthful. I was, uh, I was extremely sore before the election. Uh, um, but how how we've been treated in, in relation to the uh, the border down the RIC, and it took me quite a time to 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 um, get over that in, in a way, or, or, or learn to live with it. Perhaps is a better way to put it. Um, uh, and and uh, I think maybe um, uh, my people, my constituents, were were very sore about it as well. I. I described uh, Boris Johnson as a guy who uh, takes your Alsatian dog for a walk, brings you back a chihuahua, and he thinks it's all right. No, it's not, no. And I didn't feel all right for a long time, yeah, yeah. But we, we, we are building those relationships now. We have, um, they, they, they are taking time, the MPs, to come and speak to us now. It's, uh, it's, it seems a wee bit of soreness that we probably experienced and that they knew we were, uh, that they're now looking to see what they can do to make it better, uh, what they can do to work alongside us, uh, uh, and, and I think maybe from that point of view, Alex, I think we've got some some possibilities. I always look for the best in people, and, and, and that's my nature. Um, and, and I think maybe with an 80 seat, 80 seat majority, they might be a wee bit more gracious, a wee bit more magnanimous, a wee bit more understanding, because they can afford to be. Well, you would say, I would say that, and maybe we'd all say that. But I, 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 I live in the hope of the, that the party and the Conservatives in particular, I remind them regularly that they are the Conservative and Unionist Party. Uh, and I try to remember what it means to be a Unionist. Uh, we're, it's not just a paper thing with us, it's, it's our life. Uh, and we want to be uh, uh, uni in the United Kingdom, Great Britain and Northern Ireland as an integral, pr uh, equal part uh, on, on that. Um, unfortunately, perhaps at this moment in time, I don't believe we are. Yeah. So let's talk about the mm -hmm. six, eight, ten years mm -hmm. of Ireland effectively yeah. being an economic entity which is going to be different in some ways yeah, yeah. from Northern Ireland and the UK mm -hmm. as an economic entity. Mm -hmm. What are the implications of that? What do you look at? If you look into your yeah. Stangford crystal ball and say what's going to happen in six, eight, ten years as a result of that, wh what is the answer you get? I think the, the one thing that we, we perhaps maybe have some influence on, and that's through the Northern Ireland Assembly. Uh, the Northern Ireland Assembly will have a, uh, an influence on how, what direction Brexit takes. Uh, so, but uh, again, we don't have a majority. Uh, uh, unions don't have a majority in the Northern Ireland Assembly anymore. They don't have a majority at Westminster either. You know, from the MPs who are elected, not from those who attend. Uh, so things have changed mathematically. Th there is a, a demographic change. 
of, of, of population and those who are unionists, those who see themselves as nationalists. I think we've got a reminder um, that not every person who votes nationalist is necessarily a nationalist. Same in Scotland, if you don't mind me saying. Um, and and, and um, I think that, that the unionists themselves uh, would, should be reassured by that, that we have uh, no appetite for uh, a, a border poll, uh, no appetite for that border poll giving any sort of a change whatsoever. Uh, and, and I think British government are quite clear they don't want to see the border poll coming. Um, and, and I think now we have the Republic of Ireland who don't want to see the border poll either. And do you have a cast a smile when you hear arguments at Westminster about when there could be another referendum in Scotland, <laughs> when you know, as I know, yeah. that within the Good Friday Agreement, mm. there was provision in theory for a seven year <laughs> re look yeah. at the question in Northern Ireland. Have you ever thought I should just get up and, and spike the minister's guns by telling him something he probably doesn't know? Look, I'm one who believes in the union. Uh, my people believe in the union. It's the most important issue, much more important than Brexit over the last election for, for my people. Uh, any of the installations that I did through my Orange uh, contacts in January, the big issue for them was the union. All the political parties were told very clearly what they wanted, the assembly back and working, health addressed, education addressed, roads addressed, all accountability, have ministers in place who they know and who they can, they can ask for, for, for the change. I, I'm, I believe I reflect that opinion uh, and that opinion is clear. They, they want a working assembly, they've now got it. Now let's work to make sure that it happens and delivers over the next two years because I think it's very important that we do. Tim Shannon, thank you very much. Alex, my pleasure. Thank always good to see you by the yeah. way. You know, always a pleasure, always a pleasure. As we have seen today, there is new thinking underway in Northern Irish Unionism, but certainly as yet, no agreed route forward. Some believe that even post-Brexit, the line can be held on cross-community support for the Union, but others argue that this is the time to negotiate a new settlement before demographics move irredeemably in favour of a united Ireland. Next week, we turn to the nationalist politicians and community campaigners and ask what conversations are being held to reconcile all of Northern Ireland to a time of likely political ascendancy of the nationalist community. But for now, from Alex, myself and all at the team, it's goodbye and we hope to see you all then.